If you're going to teach about cold water immersion, the first thing you need to know is really understand how thermoregulation works. And uh, it can be complicated, but you can just think of it as a house heating system. You have the house, which is the body, and we have a thermostat in the house, which is really in the body, it's the hypothalamus, that is our control system in the brain. And you have windows and you have a furnace. If you open the windows, it's like vasodilation or the body letting blood flow out to the periphery. If you close the windows, it's like vasoconstriction or we decrease blood flow to the periphery and that either lets more heat out of the house or in. And we have the furnace which produces heat. So if we relate this to the body, the hypothalamus is the central controller of the, of the thermoregulatory system. And it, it gets information, just like our thermostat in the house does, it gets information from all over the body, from the hypothalamus itself, mainly from the skin. This is what we experience when we feel cold. We're getting information from the skin. When the thermostat or the hypothalamus sees that we either are getting warm or cold, it initiates various responses. Warm responses are vasodilation and sweating, and that's not so important for us. But when the hypothalamus feels that we're getting cold, it invokes several responses. The first one being behavior. Normally when we go out, if we feel cold, uh, we will either go back inside or put some more clothing on. But if that isn't sufficient or we don't do that, then the body invokes two main responses. And essentially that's vasoconstriction and shivering. First of all, vasoconstriction happens mainly in the vessels in the hands and the feet. And when these vessels close, it actually has a, a huge effect on the blood flow of the whole arm. And uh, when we want to lose heat, we, we have flush skin and we send blood out to the arms and the legs. But when we want to conserve heat, we shut the window or vasoconstrict. And uh, when, when all of us, when we've been cold, we've certainly experienced that our skin feels really, really cold because we have decreased the blood flow there. And that decreases heat loss in the body's effort to protect the core. That's the most important. It's a problem, you might get frostbite, but the body's trying to protect the core. Now, what most of us really feel, and we, and we see every time we put somebody in the cold water, is shivering thermogenesis. And a lot of people don't really understand the value of shivering. That is the furnace. And if vasoconstriction isn't enough to, to maintain the body's core temperature, then we kick in shivering and produce heat. Right now, each one of us is producing about 100 watts of heat. So you can think of a 100 watt light bulb, how much heat that is, that's what each of us are doing. Shivering can be an incredibly strong source of heat. When we shiver vigorously, we can produce three or four or even 500 watts of heat. That's important to think of not only when we're when we're in cold stress, but also when someone is rewarming, which we will talk about at a later time. The goal of shivering then is to prevent hypothermia. It happens very early on during cold stress. A lot of people think I was shivering, so therefore I was hypothermic, but it's really a preventative measure. It's there to prevent hypothermia or at least slow the onset of hypothermia. And later on, if we can harness it in a dry, insulated victim, it can actually power rewarming. I want to show you some evidence that demonstrates how powerful shivering heat production is. This is an experiment we did and uh, you can just see there's two panels here. The top panel is core temperature and the bottom panel essentially is heat production. And uh, the stimulus here, we put someone for two hours just dressed in a bathing suit in 50 degree air. So it was pretty cool. And uh, as you can see, that the, the heat production went up really high and then kind of dropped down, and that represents shivering sort of vigorously and then kind of at a moderate level. And the result was that for the last part of the two hours, the core temperature was actually higher than before the person went in the cold air. And that just demonstrates the, 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 the value of heat production that actually prevented core temperature decrease. Then we put someone in 60 degree water. The temperature is a little higher, but because it's water, the cold stress was much greater. And as you can see, the heat production went much, much higher and stayed high for the last two of three hours. This was a three hour immersion. And during the first hour, there was a slight two degree drop in core temperature. But then eventually the heat production got high enough that for the last two hours, 
in this 60 degree water, it prevented any further drop in core temperature. Well, everyone will eventually cool if you make the water cold enough. And we put this person in 44 degree water. And as you can see, during the one hour of immersion, the heat production continued to rise throughout the entire trial. And because the water was so cold, indeed, the core temperature did continue to drop for the whole period. However, if the person was not shivering at all, uh, the core temperature would have dropped much quicker. So there you have it. Shivering is a very, very powerful tool. So here's a test question for the end of the chapter. If you had a mildly hypothermic person and you were going to give them a drink, and you would only do this with someone who is alert and uh, not going to choke, but if you were going to give them something, would you give them a hot or a warm drink of water or a cool beer or an ice cold soft drink? Okay, most people would say give them the warm water. The answer is actually if you had this choice, you would give them an ice cold Coke. If you do the, if you do the physics on it, the, the amount of heat that you would have in one or even two drinks of warm water is not going to make any difference uh, to the core temperature. What's really important in any of these drinks is the calories from the sugar that's in the soft drink because that is what will help fuel this shivering heat production. Now, of course, if you had a choice, the best thing would be to give a warm chocolate uh, so that uh, a chocolate drink would have some, uh, some calories in it, and certainly it feels great when you drink a warm drink. But it's the calories to, sh to fuel shivering that's so important. Are there any questions about the things we've talked about so far? Yes. In the cooling process, have you noticed that there's any difference between men and women? There are some physiological differences in how women and men respond to temperature, but by far the biggest influence is body mass. This is the one time when it's an advantage to be either bigger and heavier or have more fat. And so the reality is that because men are generally bigger than women and have more body mass, they will generally cool slower.